and welcome to the Punks in Pubs podcast. My name is Liam Bird and happy birthday to us. Punks and Pubs has been going for one year and I can't thank you guys enough for sticking around and supporting a new podcast. I've spoken about this before, but the podcast came about because of depression. It's uh, no stretch to say that this podcast was the first steps of helping me improve my mental well-being. So thank you. Thank you for helping me build my confidence back up and for letting me into your lives over the past year. As it's the one year anniversary of the show, I've purposely picked an interview where everything that could go wrong did go wrong. So Mike Lee's broke, the the tablet that I took with me died out that had all my questions on and in all honesty I got a bit drunk during this interview because the interview took place late in the evening after being delayed at this year's Rebellion Festival. We were backstage, beer were flowing and then my guest turned up. I probably should have been more professional but hey ho. We've got an interview. Um, I've picked this interview because for me, it shows that this podcast is not meant to be the world's best podcast that's clean and crisp. I like the fact that sometimes things go wrong. I like the fact that sometimes it sounds a bit grungy and a little bit shitty. I like the fact it's not produced to an inch of its life. It's meant to be about having fun and talking to people who I find interesting and who I feel I can engage with enough that you people will stick around for the ride. If you don't like one particular episode, you can get off and you can start riding another episode because, my friends, I plan on doing this podcast as long as you guys are riding with me. For episode 26, I bring to you the Lawrence Arms, Neil Hennessy. Okay, so a quick story uh, to kind of explain how this interview came about. I emailed Vanessa at Fat Records to set up the interview. She was like, yeah, that's cool. It should be fun for them. Uh, she told me that Toby from uh, Red Scare will look after you uh, while at the fest. So I emailed Tony saying, hey, dude. I hope you're well. Uh, can you let me know which of the guys I'll be talking to so I can plan my questions around that person? The email that I got back <laughs> made me laugh and it went something like this. For some reason, Vanessa, this is Toby talking, for some reason, Vanessa has set up an interview with Neil, who plays drums. Neil's a rad hang, but he's never done press, so it should be pretty cool. I hope that's all right with you, Toby. So... Neil is indeed a rad dude and he gave me so much time and I really enjoyed talking to him and I hope that comes across in the episode. Because of this, it is a bit of a bumper one, so uh, stick around. You might have to break it up. I don't know. It's up to you guys. Live your own life. So what do we talk about? Well, you will hear from the off that Neil is a little coy when he's talking about his role in any of the bands that he's played with um, as his role as a drummer and he schools me fast on why the drum beat is not the linchpin that I believed it was for all music. Neil takes us on a journey on how he discovered punk and its meaning to him. I asked him about his early life in music, in particular his time working with Tim, the lead singer of Rise Against, before Tim and Neil both went off to their own respective bands. And Neil explains why 1973 was the definitive year for all music, while also showing love to Asian Man Records' Mike Park and Red Scare Records. We of course talk about the Lawrence Arms, as well as the punk supergroup that is Falcon. Uh, you will hear throughout this interview, I keep saying Falcons, not Falcon. So my bad on that view. Uh, try and ignore it. I asked Neil what the difference between Fat and Epitaph is, having been signed to both of them. And Neil ends the podcast with a now annual Fat Mike story. As I said at the start, this interview took place at Rebellion Festival and you can go get tickets for next year's Rebellion Festival at rebellionfestival.com. For people tuning in for the first time, uh, just let you know I dedicate the end of the podcast to you and your band. Playing at the show this week is an 11 piece band. Yes, 11 piece. They even have a flutist. Uh, they are based in London and Kent and they are called Just Say Nay. You're going to want to stick around for them. If you are in a band or you are a solo artist and want to play out the end of the podcast, then send your MP3s and a brief about the band to punksandpubs at gmail. Com. A quick update about the website before we start. Punks and Pubs no longer has a website. It was costing me too much. Uh, my contract was up. They wanted too much money. I'm the one who's paying for all this. I am broke. So I decided to let it go. But you 
can help me soon with my cash flow problems. Uh, I am going to be creating some t-shirts that will be on sale very soon. I think you're going to dig them. I really do. Uh, I know I do. So if you don't like them, at least I have uh, t-shirts that I will be giving to my friends and family for the next 50 Christmases and birthdays. Uh, they will be £15 each, not including postage and packaging. So keep your eyes on the Punks and Pubs socials at Punks and Pubs for all that information. Also go to the socials anyway, but in particular, go to the socials and check out the Punks in Pubs new promo video uh, that the person who helps me with my audio, Steve Burke, created. He is available to hire. Uh, so call um, call him. Uh, you can hit I'm sure he'd be pissed off if I gave out his, if I gave out his number right now. Uh, you can hit him up on Twitter at Stephen Burke 123. The video is amazing and I, I'm like I'm blown away by how good it is. Uh, definitely go check it out. Uh, please retweet it. Show your friends. It's it's just it's just really good. I really like it. Go check it out. Right, that's enough of that. Let's give you the interview. Right, people of the world, I give you episode 26 of Punks in Pubs, Neil Hennessy of the Lawrence Arms. I'll talk to you again after this chat. Until then, enjoy. I'm like a record player. I keep going round with the needle in my arm making someone else's sound. And lately I've been dreaming of blue and empty skies but nothing like that ever crosses red and weary eyes. I've been traveling out with bottles, working close to cans, sitting up for hours in my best friend's in a van. Not to say that this ain't living, but I don't know what they mean. Cause I don't feel that I barely even look alive to me. It's the only game that I know how to play. The time, the time to say goodbye. Past us long ago. And I would say, I'm gonna say, my welcome bus, you know. Backstage at Rebellion Festival, and I am with a man who does not really do press. Why don't you do press, Neil? Well, I feel in uh, most of the bands I've played in over the years, there's other people that can <laughs> more clearly uh, explain what we do or what you know is happening in the band I'm playing at the time, or yeah. or what. So it's it's interesting though because um, I spoke to Tom earlier and uh, from Menzingers, and he was like, "You're the nicest guy ever." And then Toby from Red Scare, he's like, you're the nicest guy ever. And um, then Stacy from Bad Cop, Bad Cop, you're the nicest guy ever. So why are you on mic? That's, that's high praise, you know? I don't, it, um, I don't know. I really, I don't necessarily uh, feel comfortable a lot of times speaking about things, especially when, you know, I don't necessarily write the lyrics or the, or the chords of the music. I'm helping a lot of musicians, whether it's Lawrence Arms or, you know, when I was in other bands. Um, I feel like they, I don't know, other musicians had a better idea of what was going on. Like, I really, I'm truly just here to kind of like help people finish songs and create whatever world they're trying to <laughs> get going. You know? Without the beat, there's nothing, so... That's not true. You don't think so? No, because the beat is in the syncopation of the guitar and and it's it's in there. Like, the way the way I see it is... Thank you so much. I just got handed a beer here. Do you know that guy? I met him earlier. But yeah, his, one of his band played uh, with Lawrence Arms about eight years ago. I think oh, his band nice. was called the Disaster March after a Lawrence Arms song. Anyways, so the beat. So the beat, yeah. Like my my interpretation of a beat is generally what's going on in the guitar, up and down. <laughs> you know, it's like it's there. It's it's already rhythmically there, and then you can go against it if you want, yeah. or you can go with it, or you can try something new. And I just sort of, I don't know. That's my place. So when it, when doing an interview about the, you know, the lyrical depth or, you know, like the artwork or things like that, it's like I love all that stuff. Like that's that's the package. But my part of it doesn't seem like I. I don't, the process to me isn't that interesting. Well, bless for you thinking this is going to be uh, depthful. <laughs> I must say for the listeners, uh, one of my mic leads is, is packed up, so we, we're now sharing a mic. So if you hear like one of us cut out, uh, that's why. Um, so did you fly out yesterday? Uh, I left LA on Tuesday afternoon, got into London on Wednesday afternoon, and then drove up here to the Rebellion Fest and got to hang out with... Menzingers, Bad Cop, all these, you know, all these bands we've known for years, converging on this uh, northern England punk 
scene. It's pretty, it's pretty amazing, actually, the rebellions. I've never been up here. Yeah. And seeing the generations of punk rock and the fact that it's, I mean, it's, a, it's more than a lifestyle. I mean, it's just, it's, it is, it's just what these folks are doing, like, for their whole life, you know? I think where I come from, punk rock can be something that people grow out of you know, demands of society and all that kind of stuff. So coming here, it's just like, it's really cool. <laughs> I, like, I like it. It is a weird place though, because like you've got, you've got the proper old school oi bands mixing in with um, the Scar Kids as well. So Mad Caddies I know are playing in a bit. So it is like a nice general mix. And I think that for me shows the community that punk is. It shows you that it isn't just about the oi. It's not just about the woes. It's about so much more, and you do get that kind of community spirit. Definitely, and like I, so I grew up in the '90s uh, Chicago punk scene, which is you know about 20 years after the initial start of, of punk rock. So like by the time punk rock met you know the, the the suburbs of Chicago where I'm from, it was very inclusive. There was a lot of just at anyone was um, invited if they wanted to be there. We had, uh, at sh I mean, this is like mid '90s. You know, we had hardcore bands that they would play a 30-minute set, and half of their set would be speaking about social injustice or racism or sexism or classism, and trying to teach people about things rather than just playing music and not really know what someone's screaming about and floor punching or whatever you know kind of dancing you're going to do. It was really informative, and there'd be pamphlets in the back about animal cruelty or, you know, uh, suicide uh, help hotlines and stuff like that. So that was my initial sort of thought about punk rock was it was just everyone and anyone. There was no, no exclusion. And so to come out here and be like, oh, right, like the old school punkers, that's a thing. And it had to grow to get to where I then was able to sort of see it. And then, you know, I've been a part of Whatever side of the punk scene you want to call it, I don't even know. Like, it's not post-punk, but it's kind of, I, don't, I don't really even know. It's um, we've just sort of moved in, and you know, we've met the bands that we're friends with, like Hot Water Music, or you know, like Lagwagon, or these certain bands where it's like, wow, we would have never maybe played with you or got to know you if we didn't get out of Chicago and try to put out records with other labels and, and get from, you know, from Asia Man to Fat Records and eventually Epitaph. Like, these moves, they seem like moves, but to me it was like, we're just kind of in the punk scene still. Like, it all sort of made sense. So, I don't know. I'm just, it's cool to come out here and just see it all layered, <laughs> coming together. With every single story, let's all start at the beginning. I mean, what, what was your introduction to punk music or music in general? Like, is it family? Was it friends? Uh, yeah, I mean... It, I was attracted to music without really even knowing what it was. Like when it played through the speakers, I just loved it. And I remember in the early 80s, I was born in the late 70s, so like early 80s, I was probably three or four years old, maybe five. And I remember uh, my mom had a cassette of Culture Club, Color by Numbers, and Lionel Richie dancing on the ceiling. And so that was like my first sort of like, oh, I want to play these tapes over and over and listen and, you know, just feel the, the weird whatever music was. I had no idea it was even people playing instruments. You know, it was just this feeling. Um, was it feeling of dancing or was it feeling of like, I, don't, I, don't, I just don't understand what this it was, is. It was just overwhelming. Like I remember, I, I don't know if I actually have, if this really happened, but when I think back, I think of uh, sounds as like shapes. Like when I was really young, I almost have like these weird memories that are like triangles and and circles kind of coming at me from the speakers for whatever. I'm, I know this sounds like weird shit, but it's like Were your parents drugging you? No, not not at all, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> parents are uh, opposite uh, sort of mindset, but but that was like my response. Like I was just sort of like, oh, this is whatever this is is like really intriguing, and then eventually. You know, I got to like the mid 80s and I, I, I loved Run DMC, Raising Hell. That was one of my first cassette tapes that I bought like on my own. I, was, I, don't, I don't remember what year that came out, like 84 or 85. So I was like six or seven, maybe. And then from there, it was like whatever my brother would have around cassette tape wise or whatever, we would, you know, I'd put in like Guns N' Roses, Appetite for Destruction eventually and, and that kind of stuff. And, there was no punk rock at all. I had seen a Clash video when I was younger, but it didn't resonate with me at all. 
And um, and then right around like, I guess it would be like eight, late 80s into 90, uh, my brother started bringing home CDs because uh, that was the rage, I guess, at that point, right? <laughs> and he brought home things like the um, uh, Fugazi, 13 songs, uh, the Black Flag with the yellow cover. I don't know what that's called. Yeah, I never got into Black Flag, but... No, uh, I, I would go into my brother's room and I'd steal like four or five CDs at a time and I'd play them all and then, and then I would put back the ones I didn't like and I'd keep the ones I liked for like a, actually, a little longer. And I just always held on to the, the Fugazi CD. That was the one I always kind of came back to. And it still didn't know what punk was. Like I was just grabbing CDs from my, my brother's room. And, um, and then there was a point kind of getting into, I guess it would be like late, late middle school, like you know about 13 years old where I started kind of getting into like Red Hot Chili Peppers or like, you know, almost like like Red Hot Chili Peppers and like Nine Inch Nails and uh, yeah. sort of darker, kind of weirder on one side, but then also like, you know, Red Hot Chili Peppers was funky and kind of punk. It was like punk funk or whatever. No, 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 I completely agree. I, I think the Chili's, like their early stuff, completely is punk for me. I, I, I like the, the sound signatures they were using was like fucking phenomenal. Flea on bass is like for me probably one of the like the best punk bassist ever, even though he's never really claimed himself to be a punk. I think they definitely adopted the punk thing, and then they also loved, you know, uh, funk uh, Parliament and, and just sort of like musicianship on top of punk. Um, have, you, have you seen that documentary, Def? Have you, have you heard about it? So Def are a funk punk band from like the 1960s. Detroit. And they're from Detroit, yeah, 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 and uh, they've now been, they've now got like a um, second wind because people are now describing them as actually the first punk band with the punk sound before it was punk. And it's just that idea of funk and punk and actually it's always kind of been interlinked. Yeah, I know, I know of that story, but I haven't seen the documentary and I've, I've heard, I've heard the death songs around because I know they released some tunes a few years ago, yeah. like they, they put it out and it kind of got people's attention for a little while. But yeah, I, I love all that stuff. I love finding out about little root bands that started some sort of feel somewhere at some point in time because everything gets, everything gets layered on top of and eventually disappears anyways. Like, um, so anytime anything could just sort of be given credit for doing something unique, I think it's great. Um, but then, yeah, so then, like, as I'm ending middle school, uh, getting into, like, high school, I start meeting kids that were into Dead Kennedys, and they're into Screeching Weasel, and they were into Green Day, and this is what this would have been, like, pre-Dookie, or, like, right, right at that time, you know? Like, Lookout Records, kind of. Yeah, totally. So, so I'm meeting these kids of my freshman year of high school that summer before, and, um, I'm starting to kind of like, my brother had instruments around because he was kind of getting into playing guitar and then there was a drummer from the neighborhood who brought a drum set over and a bass player from the neighborhood brought a bass rig over and they would just jam, you know, all afternoon and then they'd leave and go get food or go smoke pot or whatever and I would just run down in the basement and just play every instrument just as much as I could while they were gone. Like secretly or did you tell them or was it like your own little secret? Were you like running downstairs going, are oh, they going to be out for like 20 minutes? Run, like Yeah, just like that. Like I would be like, oh, they left. I know they're going to go to like Billy's and get a burger. Billy's was a, a, a burger joint. And um, it would take them, at, yeah, at least an hour or something. And I would just go down there and I would, I would just hit stuff. And then eventually meeting kids uh, freshman year that were into all these different punk bands. They were picking up the guitar and bass, and we were trying to figure out how to like get together and start a band. And it was awful. I mean, it was like our bass player couldn't remember the song twice. You know, like it would <laughs> it would always be like, no, no, don't you remember we just played <laughs> this like ten minutes ago? You should be able to do that again. Um, and just a lot of directions going everywhere. We wanted to be Ween meets Dead Kennedys meets Screeching Weasel. It's like it was like very bizarre and then I heard this cassette tape it would have been probably the year after of uh, a band called Baxter which is uh, Tim McGrath from Rise Against yeah, one of my questions yeah yeah so so I he he had made a tape with um, his friend Jay and his friend Anthony under the name Baxter and they made this red clear cassette tape with a yellow jacket it was like kind of really interesting looking and there was uh, a kid 
that went to my high school that knew Tim. He went to an adjacent high school, like in a town over. And we were we were like, I don't remember exactly where we were, but I heard this cassette tape, and he told me like, yeah, these guys are you know sophomores over at this other school. It was like what? Like these guys are my age writing these songs, and the songs were like well crafted. I mean, Tim is Tim is a very very good songwriter, and he was even when he was 15, 16. I mean, he's refined it obviously, but. And so I sort of made it my mission because I wanted to seek out these people that were my age making this music. Because I knew my friends were never going to excel to that point. And I saw something in that demo tape and then eventually just went to the where everyone skates together, where all the different high schools like kind of meet, a place called Fountain Park. And we would all just like meet up and skate and you know talk shit and go to Denny's and just do whatever you know whatever things kids do kind of fuck off and I at one point I just I told Tim I was like hey man I really like that tape I would love to like play music and uh, at the time their drummer had left he was like yeah come on over and like I knew how to play a little drum so I started jamming on drums with uh, Tim and Jay and he would show me like Jawbreaker and he showed me like Rancid, and he showed me more local stuff like Cap and Jazz, Psychic Cato, and these things um, that I had not heard of at all. Like these were these were things that were a little more like, like oh yeah, I never really got into those bands. And then I played drums for maybe like two or three practices, and then I was like, you know, I really want to learn how to play guitar in a band because I, I loved his songs, and I was like, you should get another drummer and I'll be the second guitar player. So then I, for like about two or three years, I we got another drummer and I was the guitar player and we wrote probably a good 20 songs in that formation, which is where I then eventually met Chris and Brendan because they had a band called The Broadways. And um, Baxter would play with Broadways all the time. Broadways guys were, were like, vocally fans. They're like, you know, Baxter's cool. And we're just like, awesome. Like the guy from Slapstick is, in a new band and he the, that band thinks our band's cool it was like this sort of like w- welcoming us to this thing and that was sort of the birth to me of like what punk rock was yeah. because I, I didn't have any like context of like mohawks or or any of that kind of you know like whatever aesthetic you want to put to it it was more just like meeting people in your point in time where you exist that you relate to that are is also interested in things that you find interesting that just happen to be underground music or whatever, you know. Um, and then it, it kind of just barrel rolls into the day that we're in today because <laughs> it's like I met Chris and Brendan. I would go hang out with Brendan when I was still in high school and he had graduated and I'd go to the city and we would just bounce around the city all day. And then eventually our bands just split and it was like sort of a natural progression. Backing up though, you said that when you met those guys, they, they were like introducing you to punk rock. Were you a bit intimidated? Because it is intimidating. If, if you meet someone who knows a genre, who is like so like on point, and you're like, I like two bands, you kind of bullshit your way until you kind of get on their level. Like, was that intimidation when you met them? You know, those guys are intimidating, but not in a way that's like, um, overt like they're not gonna come up and question me about what I do or don't know yeah but it's more like in the way they walk into a room together with their instruments you're just like oh shit like you know I'm I'm a teenager I mean they were teenagers too actually but a couple years older at that age seems older you know yeah, where you're yeah, like yeah. oh those guys are 19 and I'm 16 yeah. 
it's a little older, you know. Um, they can nitty by booze. Almost, yeah. <laughs> but they also lived in the city, and, and so to be able to go in the city and be a part of whatever was going on there, it helped. But yeah, like, the intimidation thing, really, it was very just quick. It was like the first couple shows we played, first one specifically, and then other ones, but they just, it lightened up as we just socialized and eventually I would just go on tour with the Broadways not on tour, but on the weekends they'd go up to uh, Milwaukee or Madison or Minneapolis Detroit, and I would just hop in the van and hang with them yeah. you know, and that was sort of like next level, you know, just like, oh now we're buds and I'm in your van and I'm still in high school, but I'm going to Milwaukee with you tonight you know, to this punk show You said like Tim was a fantastic songwriter even when he was young when you guys decided actually we're done with this band, were you like, he's going to fucking do another band and it's going to be amazing? I wish I was still there. Like, I wish I was still working with him. Oh, no, it wasn't like that because Tim and I were living together when the band broke up and it was the kind of thing that our band, so the band version with, uh, with me on guitar and um, Jay on bass, Tim Remus was the drummer. Uh, he plays in a band called Sweet Cobra and... He also plays with uh, Jason Narducci, who's Bob Moult's bass player and um, Super Chunk's bass player. Like he plays drums for his solo projects. That version of the band was very cohesive and very much everyone had the same vision musically, and it it sort of gelled really well. And then we lost, like Remus left the band, and then Jay eventually left, and we replaced them. And we tried to keep it going for a little while, and it didn't have that same thing that it did when we were in high school just kind of fucking around and you know it, it wasn't as visceral it was a little harder to to conjure up and the guys that we got are great it's it's that inexplicable x factor that just sort of disappeared you know while we were living together you know it, i was hanging with brendan and he he actually tim actually jammed with brendan one night because we were all that's kind of how that was back then like everyone just kind of jammed with people and if it gelled it gelled uh, Tim also played in the Honor System, which is the other half of the Broadways. He played bass on uh, their demo tape. Um, at that time, we were all just doing whatever was the next thing coming towards us, you know. And Tim and I would continue to write songs together on our off time, yeah. you know, just sort of like he would, he would just like come over with a song that's like 70% done, and then I would maybe help with like a backup vocal harmony or finish a lyric somewhere or just like be there to like kind of help help it you know kind of flourish and then that's that's what swing life away came out of one of those moments well hold up because we're going to talk about that later on i'm going to use up my good stuff before we start talking about lawrence arms um i got told to ask you about music in 1973 oh yeah yeah so <laughs> I, I, I talked to someone about it. yeah you did you're gonna, you're gonna mess you're gonna you're gonna try and guess Menzingers. Oh, was it? Yeah, yeah there it is. Yeah. No, I, I think it's something that I've actually said to a couple different people because it's, it's, it's a crossover year to me with production and performance of musicianship. You look at a Boston recording in 1975 or 76. You can't make that record in 1970. You know, you can't. The technology and the the a sonic understanding is just so different, you know. So when you come out of the 60s and you're making records, you have to be really good at your instrument. You have to be one take, like, fret everything perfect, you know, like, it doesn't have to be perfect, but it has to, you have to fit the song in the moment, because it's, hap it's, you know, you don't, you don't have pro tools to just sit there and record over and over. Or eventually, even in the late 70s, you know, they could put together five tape machines and have a hundred some odd tracks or whatever where they could mess around with all these different things so 1973 and this is you know, whatever I'm just I just picked that year because of the, the what I just said but also like I feel like every genre in that time frame is figuring itself out you could listen to like a Johnny Cash recording or you could listen to like a Bob Marley recording uh, or what I, I mean, there's just all these different places that you could go and you see where everyone's, how everyone's using that technology then with that yeah. performance. And I don't know. I'm sure there's other fascinating years in music. And I don't think it's necessarily the best for songwriting or like 
that kind of thing. It's more just for like recording. <laughs> Like heady, heady recording bullshit that doesn't really matter, I guess. Well, no, you say that, though, but, I mean, I think anyone would give their left bollock to have been in a time where was Johnny Cash, Jimi Hendrix, and Bob Marley were just fucking playing music. They're, for me, the, the pinnacle of, of that kind of music. Yeah, I could feel that. We, I mean, we're called punks and pubs, so let's talk a little bit about alcohol. Have you ever gone for a beer with someone and gone a bit starstruck? Like, because you tour a lot, so do you ever, like, go, oh, fuck, there's Dave Grohl, or... Oh fuck! There, there's um, I don't know. Well, it's other people. Yeah, you know, I'm sure it has. I can't, I can't think of anything specifically. I mean, there's always moments where, like, you know, we'll be on a flight somewhere and we're on a plane with DMX, or like, there's, you know, those moments. But it's almost, it's funny to me. It's, it's not even. It's not like my heart starts beating fast and I'm like, <laughs> oh my god, there's this guy or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This girl. It's, it's more like, oh yeah, look at that. There's that person. Um, I mean, I, I moved to Los Angeles recently, and every other day I'm seeing B and A list celebrities like walking around, just doing normal things or whatever. So it's like that. That's sort of decreased a lot of whatever that might be. But I would say the answer to that is probably not. <laughs> no, it's like no. <laughs> Only idea of you just walking past and Chris Pratt sounding the piss in the street. Well, that's, that's nice. One time I walked by Mark McKinney of the Kids in the Hall, <laughs> and he's just sort of like looking left and right and just kind of like minding those business and I just walked by and I'm like hey Mark what's going on and he's like oh hey and then I just kept walking because I was so nervous <laughs> that I didn't I didn't want to get into a conversation because I didn't know what I was going to say yeah. and I was wearing a University of Toronto t-shirt for whatever reason I don't know why and that's he's I don't think he's from Toronto but he obviously kids in the hall are yeah. famous from Toronto but um that that kind of moment where I was like oh I have an opportunity to say hi to this guy that I've loved for 20 30 years but I have nothing to say after. I have no follow-up. I have no <laughs> you know, follow-up. It's like, and I knew, I, I knew that he didn't, he didn't look like he wanted to talk to me. <laughs> you know, it was like, he was clearly in his own zone. So what made you move back behind the drum kit, Sam, with Lawrence Arms? Oh, well, that was sort of a, a conscious decision because when Brendan uh, sort of contacted me to start a, a band, I, he knew me as a guitar player. So we were going to get a drummer and then be a three-piece with me on guitar and I uh, for whatever reason I don't I feel like I didn't want to like play the same instrument in subsequent bands for I feel like that was just a weird idiosyncratic thing I did in my head back then yeah so I told Brendan I was like well you know I can play drums a little bit I had played in a band in like 93 for for maybe like a year but terribly because it was with that first band (laughs) so um so then it was like, all right, I got to get a drum set, got some stuff. And then it was like, I, that was when I really kind of dove into learning what drums could be about. Because like that first, the first two Lawrence Arms records, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. Like I'm just playing the straightest beats and sort of ignoring some of like Chris and Brendan's little moments. And I'm just plowing through because I didn't have that understanding of nuance or technique or anything. And just hard as I can hit it, just keep it going. You know? So whenever you play those shows live now, do you like what the fuck? Am I like those songs? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we don't play the older ones too often. We play "Evening of Extraordinary Circumstance." It's probably a tad slower, <laughs> but I've added things, and there's definitely more nuance. And there's things where, you know, we figured out, oh, this would be cool if we hit a stop right here on this word, and then came back in on the next word. Did they ever turn around and go, "Look at him being hot shit"? Uh, there's there are moments where I'll do something kind of stupid in my mind and then like Brennan will turn around and be like yeah he'll give me like a, one of those faces like that was cool and I'll be like yeah I don't know I just kind of went into that I didn't know how it was going to end and I actually still don't know how it ended because now I'm in this, the next part and I, I'm not thinking about it you're already gone yeah see you later bye I don't think drummers need to adhere to the record the album you know I think if you're feeling something in the moment on drums Go for it. As long as as long as you understand the song, I mean, don't go so out far outside of it that everyone's gonna go, "What the fuck was that?" But if you're feeling a little fill, do it. You know? Yeah, it's like why not? I've read some of Brandon's interviews, and Brandon said that when the band started, you wanted to be the Google Dolls. Well, that's Brandon and Chris. Well, you like I'm not the fucking Google Dolls. Well, I hated the Google Dolls, but I also <laughs> didn't know the Google Dolls that they listened to because they listened to the old punk stuff. Yeah. And then eventually they put out the commercial stuff, and it was a different singer, and it was a different vibe. It was yeah. acoustic, and so 
Any of the Goo Goo Dolls references that they're referring to is from an era that I'm not even familiar with. It might be cool. But, <laughs> but Goo Goo Dolls to me was always like a thumbs down to me and my friends, like when we were hanging out. It's blood out, it's blood out, it's blood out of fire. I think it's been spoken about a lot, but it'd be great to get your take on it. The name of Lawrence Islands came about complex that they lived in. And it's kind of legendary in how much of a shithole where they lived was like disgusting and like full of trash. Can you remember that? Like, can you remember going around their house and going, dude, what the fuck? And knowing that, what kind of touring guys are they? Well, at, yeah, so at the time, like going to the Lawrence Arms building, uh, it was, I believe it was a four bedroom. And the, the fourth bedroom was empty, so it was three roommates. It was Brendan and Chris and Mark uh, Zdanowski, who played in some punk bands from Chicago. The fourth bedroom was a garbage pit, basically. Like, they would just take bags of garbage and throw it in, in the spare room. It wasn't like they walked out to the dumpster or even put it on the back. It was like this room just full of garbage. And maybe, like... Once every few weeks, they would <laughs> empty it out or whatever, because they were just kind of drunk and lazy. But they were also going to college. So it was like they were partying, playing music, going to college. And, and it was just sort of like this, no, yeah, nothing, no, nothing truly got done in the way of making things clean. See, that would annoy me. Like, I'm not a clean freak, but the moment where I think there's more cockroaches than there are people in the apartment, that, that's me done. I never saw cockroaches in there. No? But... I remember on the back patio at one point there was like this like little girl's underwear next to a dead mouse and it was just sitting there for like weeks yep. and we would all just go out on the back patio and smoke and just every once in a while someone would be like yep and you sort of look down and be like yeah. I'm sure the dwarves have written a song about that at some point in their lives <laughs> yeah <laughs> Uh, but, then, but then to answer your second question, I guess the touring version of Chris and Brendan. I mean, the early days were just dirty in general. We all smoked cigarettes. We all wore our socks for more than the days that we should. And, you know, things got, things got gross fast. That's the band way. Like, you don't have time to shower. You don't really have the money for laundry. You, you put it into petrol, so... Yeah, for sure. Petrol, uh, fixing the van, trying to maybe make a t-shirt if you can. We cleaned up our act, I would say, like two or three years into touring. We got a nicer, newer van and um, just sort of realized that the nicer we kept the van, just sort of the nicer things in general could be, like in our headspace, you know, walking into the van and seeing garbage everywhere and having it smell like feet and ass is just like, it's fine for a couple years, <laughs> but then you realize, oh, it doesn't have to be that way. Girls don't like this. Maybe that's the reason. Um, you spoke about a little bit about punk being political at the beginning, like going to a show, they'll speak about animal rights or, or about human rights. Would you say the Lawrence Arms are a political band? Well, I think that the Lawrence Arms come from political awareness. Obviously, the Broadways are uh, the band preceding us that Chris and Brendan were in were politically minded. And um, <clears throat> I think Baxter, we weren't, we weren't necessarily a political band, but we played a lot of shows with political hardcore bands and stuff. So um, I would say the Lawrence Arms tried to pull ourselves away from politics and go more social and deal with more universal personal conflict, which can involve politics. But I don't think that we're overtly a political band. I don't think we've made any extreme statements other than like, helping out with Fat Mike for uh, Rock Against Bush in 2004 and 
lean, you know, lending ourselves to be a part of things that are righteous. You know, we, we put a song on the Amado Diallo comp, who was a, uh, an African American who got killed by police in like, I think it was like February of 1999. And we, we, we just, you know, we, we would just sort of do things like that seemed righteous yeah. it, without preaching or, you know, whatever. We play a benefit show, put a song on a comp and that kind of thing. But I don't know. Does that answer the question? <laughs> no, no, it does. Because I feel like you kind of spoke about before the fact that you don't feel that you can, you contribute to the lyrics, but you're still part of the band. So whenever someone steps forward and says something, it includes all of you. I, yeah, totally. I think that Chris and Brendan and myself are like not like 98 to 99 percent of the time are in a we agree on what's good or what's bad about a situation you know we when we talk about something we're usually always like yeah yeah that makes sense to all of us or no 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 that doesn't make sense to all of us so um, yeah and that that gets back to why you know I don't feel like I need to necessarily do many interviews for Lawrence Arms because those guys have good words <laughs> and they know they know what they're talking about so dude you know what you're talking about this is this is this is going well so far I say so far it could go shit <laughs> <laughs> At what point did you know that you're onto a good thing? Because uh, there's always a point with a band. Your trajectory of a band has always been kind of up for me. I, I feel that. And so, at what point, where actually you are going up, do you know this is it? This is actually going to be what we're doing for the time that we're enjoying it. Yeah. Well, uh, first of all, Mike Park is a big reason the Lawrence Arms had a stepping stone. And obviously that comes from uh, Slapstick and the Broadways being on Asian Man, so it was a connection there, you know. Um, but I would say the first time I ever thought like, wow, this could be something like a, a click or two more was the summer of 2001, we played the Warp Tour. And it was also, we had just put out the split with Mike Park's band, The, Ch the Chinkies. And somehow that split EP got around to a bunch of different record labels and we had um, Vagrant Records uh, and dr uh, Drive Through Records and Grand Royal Records. If you know who Grand Royal is, it's... I, I, uh, I know the other two, but I don't know the other one. Grand Royal is Mike D from the Beastie Boys. And, nice. Yeah, and uh, Gary Gersh and John Silva, who are the guys that are sort of the A&R representatives that signed Nirvana back in the day. So they're like these connected people and so we were playing Warp Tour and we, and we weren't playing Chicago but we were playing like Kansas City and Denver and Bozeman Montana while we were on this tour we were getting these calls or I don't even remember how we were getting the correspondence but we were getting interest from these labels about this EP or the split EP like they really liked the energy whatever and then eventually when it got to Grand Royal Grand Royal was like hey um, we're gonna call up Kevin Lyman from the Warp Tour and we're gonna have him put you on the Chicago stage. It was like, we, we played all the way up to like Kansas City, and so then there was only one or two more until Chicago. So then we just drove home and it was like a day off, and then we drove down and it, I think it was like a three in the afternoon, four in the afternoon set. And it was a day that was like 100 degrees and just ter terrible for, for people to be outside, you know? So uh, it's one of these yeah, hot days, and our, our, we have a really good friend, uh, childhood friends with like Chris McCoggan, grew up across the street from him, uh, this guy Marcus, and he was born with like barely any sweat glands. It's sort of like a bizarre thing or whatever, but, but he has to hydrate all the time, and he has to constantly have water, and, and especially when it's sunny and hot. And the Warp Tour ran out of water that day. And they had to bring, they had to like bring a shipment of water in. So there was like this hour long, two hour long period where like they ran out of bottled water for like almost everyone. And so Marcus had to leave. And this is before we played. This is at like one or two in the afternoon. And we're just sort of like kind of pissed. And like you know, there's an army recruitment station, and there's just sort of like this feeling of like, oh, this isn't like punk rock at all, kind of thing. But Mike D. Gary Gersh and John Silva all flew out, met Kevin Lyman, and they all went and watched us from the sound booth. And we played maybe two songs, and then Brendan sort of just let loose on Warp Tour. 
in front of Lyman and Mike D and, and these and Gary and John or whatever. Not that I know who they are actually, but I'm just gonna say Gary and John so I don't say their whole yeah. name. But um, he starts just going into like, you know, punk rock should be indoors at night for like five bucks and like fuck this army recruitment shit. This is terrible. They run out of water and then when they do get you water it costs ten bucks. Like he just like went into this it seemed like five minutes, but it was probably like four, 40 seconds, you know, like really. But during that time, Kevin Lyman just walked away. The other guys, I think, stayed for a, a second longer, like maybe saw a song, but then they just bolted. Kevin Lyman called our booking agent and was like, I never want to see the Lawrence Arms submitted to, to play on Warp Tour ever again. They're banned for life. And while we're on stage, she's calling Brendan's phone over and over, leaving messages like, what the fuck did you do? You know, just like pissed at us. We get off stage, get all the messages. Like, oh, I guess we blew the Grand Royal thing. <laughs> you know, like that was out of, the, out of the question. I guess like to answer your question, like that moment of getting swept up in this bizarre A&R meets like the guy from the Beastie Boys label. Um, was one of these things where it's like, oh, this, we're somehow affecting people in a way that, like, I never knew we would ever affect, you know, like, a guy from the Beastie Boys or whatever. And then right after that, like, Vagrant Records made us an offer. And because the trio, had, the Alkaline Trio had just signed to Vagrant, so they were sort of talking us up to Vagrant. And we ended up, like, we were like a day away from signing to Vagrant, and Fat Mike called us out of the blue. And he was just like, hey, I le really like that last recording you did. I want to put out your next record. We were just like, man, Vagrant offered us more money, but it's fat records, <laughs> you know? Like, it's way cooler. Yeah. And so we just we just went with fat. And they, and it was like instant family. Like, once, once we started dealing with them, and when we met them, it was like, oh, this is, this is where we should be. Like, I couldn't... I couldn't imagine had we signed to Grand Royal or Vagrant if we, what we would be today yeah. <laughs> as a band. You know, it's like, I think the progression of Asian Man Records to Fat Records to Epitaph and still being friends with all three labels and not having any, like that to me is, that's punk rock. There's no animosity. Wasting away, never felt this way before. I played all the ditties they were hollering for. And they shot at my boots and told me to dance And I didn't really want to, but before I had the chance to say my piece Everyone was laughing in my face Safe to say I hate this place Do you want to get lost? Cause I can't stay found I've done my time killing days in this town I got a little itch and I'm thirsty all I want to know is who's coming with me. Fuck you, you're cool, fuck you too. The last goodbye is simple and true. I got a fever for the cowbell boys. I fell for the beats, but I stay down for the noise. Break into something that's beautiful now. Tell me that it's gonna be okay. Or exalt my friendships and line up the bottles of being from my crib to my grave. I wrote it to end it this way. Three albums in four years uh, with Fat, and then you kind of went on a break, five year break from Lawrence Arms. Well, oh, 2006 was Old Calcutta, and then 2009 was Blood, Sweat, and Tears, the EP. Yeah. And then that was the year we recorded the DVD, and then the DVD came out in 2012, and then Metropole is in 2014. So we did stuff in there a little bit. Okay. But uh, there's a number of things that happen. I mean, life happened with, you know, marriages and kids and just sort of moving on in other elements where sometimes you need to put the band on the back burner if you're going to you know, move forward in other places, so. Well, what was the break needed? Did you actually, like, did you feel like you came back and you're like, oh, I'm really refreshed now, let's, let's go at it? Well, uh, I wouldn't put it like that because I joined the Smoking Popes when that happened. So I then, I had a seven year stint with them where I was playing, you know, 50, 70 shows a year sometimes with the Popes. 
uh, making albums and EP or an album and an EP. Um, so I, I kind of kept my creativity going. I started a band with Dan Vapid from uh, Screeching Weasel. We did a band called Noise by Numbers that I, I played drums on the first recording and then I bounced and then they got a, another guy. Um, I had a band with a guy, Pat Ford, from Colossal uh, called Birds in the Air, and we were trying to do sort of an indie rock thing. It's like, I just sort of filled my time. I was also working at Atlas uh, Studios in Chicago recording bands, so my time was still very much working with music. And then the thing with Lawrence Arms is I think we've always respected the bands, whether that's the band itself or the people in the band. So. Whenever, the, whenever it was like, yeah, we're not doing shows for a while, it wasn't necessarily like I was bummed. It was just what was happening. Yeah. You know, we all, we knew the ebb and flow, and I think we, all, we always sort of treated our band like any, any show we play could just be our last show. You never know. It's like we, we don't put stock in like, oh, five years from now, we're going to fill this room with this many people or try to meet this manager or do that. Like, we've never had an actual manager ever. Toby Jegg is, I would say he's our manager now because <laughs> he definitely corrals a lot of stuff. Toby, who runs Red Scare, by the way, for people who might not know. That's the one. Um, so he, he helps us out, but he's not like a manager. He doesn't manage bands. He's just like our buddy who helps us go on the one tour or two tours we're going to do every year or two. Um, kind of puts the fire under our, under our ass. With Toby, though, is it is like, because obviously another band you're associated with is the Falcons. The story that I've heard is that Toby was looking to leave Fat and he wanted to start his own label. And then you guys were like, actually, you fill me in. So what, what's the story? How did the Falcons start? Because is this, like, Red Scare started because of the Falcons. Yeah, I believe, I don't, I, I don't, okay, so the, I don't, the very beginning, it's either that, Brendan wanted to start a newer band and Toby said he would put it out or Toby wanted to start a label. I think to he's right there if we want to ask him. <laughs> he's just walked past this. <laughs> um, man, this is a little moment in time that I'm not 100% sure on what that, imp that impetus is. But, um, but yeah, I mean, essentially, when the Falcon, however the Falcon got, got put into Brendan's brain, he just wanted to start a band with Todd Money from Rise Against. Because Todd Money, we had just done a tour with uh, Mad Caddies and Rise Against in, in England and in Europe. And, um, and Todd Money just, he rocks so hard on stage. He's such a great guitar player and just visibly like is a rock and roller. And Brennan was just, Brennan's like, I just want to start a band with this guy, whatever, you know, sort of thing. And then fill it with friends like Dan Andriano, who played in Slapstick with Brendan and uh, me. That was just sort of a, uh, yeah, like a fun thing to do. And then, I, yeah, man, I wish I could answer that, that very beginning moment, though. Am I right in saying that when you guys played your first show, you haven't practiced? You literally practiced the day of the show? Or is that bullshit? So the very first show we ever played was, I think it was in 2006, we did, there's like a Red Scare Fest in Chicago. And Rob Kellenberger from Slapstick and Colossal and Tuesday played drums. I played guitar because Todd wasn't in the band anymore. And then Brendan and Dan. Yeah. So the first Falcon show was sort of like a, you know, bastardized version of the original formation. And do you think you'll do any more albums or do you think it's done or...? No, I think the Falcon will continue to progress and, and evolve and... There'll be something going on. I know Brendan's got a Wandering Birds record he's doing right now, and then we're talking about doing Lawrence Arms probably after that in the next, you know, year or so. And then who knows? Yeah, if, if the Falcon strikes, our fancy. <laughs> and that, I mean, the last time we put out the Falcon record, it was it it was good for for the Falcons' time, but also like Skiba had just joined Blink 182. Yeah. Andriano was was available um, a little bit more, so. We sort of, we were already working on making music, but then that happened and it was like, all right, well, let's just go a little more all in and do more touring and just make the record like that much tighter, whatever. So I think it takes things like that to shift around, not necessarily that extreme, but it takes a moment like, like, oh, hey, there's this six month or eight month period where nothing's gonna be happening for like all four of these people. <laughs> Which is very rare. So it's probably it's probably like a three, you know, a couple of years away from that happening again. We sing a song about smoking flames. We burn down our lazy yesterdays. Let's pretend this poverty is fine and sit out off our porches like we do it all the time. Yeah.
you spoke earlier on about songwriting. You touched on it, Swing Life Away was something that you co-wrote. Do, do you want to do more writing? Is it in you? Like, do you have that urge? That I, like, do you bring it forward to the guys and go, this is my music, why aren't we doing this? Uh, because just I don't want to blow smoke up your ass but that that song is is amazing it's a phenomenal song and I and I love it thank you my the, my my part on that song is is very small Tim Tim wrote the majority of that song I'm, I'm sure still the bit I love the most is, is yours <laughs> I don't yeah I don't know <laughs> why don't you tell me what it is and I'll tell you no I'm just kidding um, no you know what I I write songs every day you know I I have a little like logic recording thing on my computer i have a few guitars a bass and i i do drum programming in my apartment and i'll i'll just write whatever song comes to my mind sometimes i'll pinpoint a, a style and i'll write it but then i also have my like sort of the songs that i've been writing since tim and i were like 16 years old on the edge of the bed writing songs together i took that energy and i just keep writing in that vein and I, I probably have a good like 100, uh, 150 songs. I wouldn't say they're all done, but they're ideas enough that if I if I could just find a band and find the time and actually get it done, I could I could do it. <laughs> but um, I just haven't yet because I have all this other stuff to do, I guess. And I'm just I guess I'm a procrastinator when it comes to like my own my own work. You know, I see where it's at. And then sometimes I'm like, yeah, that's fine for now. <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I really like helping other people that have this big vision that I can try to help kind of like move, move up into it. I need someone kind of with what my headspace would be for my songs, to, like to help me out. Like I need like a drummer or a bass player to come and help me finish my songs a little bit. Because I, I tried to make a recording where I played every instrument, like a, Foo, a first Foo Fighters record kind of thing or whatever. That shit's not easy, you know? It's like, you have to know you have to know what you're doing to a certain degree before you start laying stuff down. And like, I just like, didn't have that foresight when I went into recording it that way. And I was like, I don't want to listen to a recording where I'm playing every instrument. And so I sort of dismantled that project and I've, I really haven't found people that I could bring my songs to that would under, that, I mean, I know they're out there. I just haven't sat down with them to actually get the band going. There's a drummer in Chicago named Ronnie DeCola. We got so close. We would go and jam, and it would, it would sound great. And we just never had the other elements of bass, guitar, you know, fin just, it never finished itself. So, Do you not want to do like a, a death from above kind of sound, just a, like a drum and a bass, or just a drum and a guitar? Is that nothing that, 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 you said that you needed like the other sounds to come together. Like, do you, does that not interest you, just like a two-piece band? No, I don't like that at all. <laughs> no, fair enough. <laughs> no, that to me is like, if you can do it, that's fine, but it's very, not uh, appealing to me. I need, I need more elements. So 2014, uh, Metropole was released on Epitaph, and then you went back to Fat. Why, why was that? Was it that Epitaph wasn't, you didn't feel comfortable, or they just didn't offer you a label, uh, another, another record deal? Uh, no, no, it's, uh, it really came out of Fat Wreck approaching us with an idea. We didn't, we didn't come, with, come up with the, uh, the greatest hits idea. I believe, I don't know if, if it was Fat Mike or Aaron or who, but they basically said like, you know, people online consume music differently. It would be cool like if you put together what you think could represent you and your best, you know, 20 or 25 songs so that we could put it up and sort of let people know maybe an obscure song from the past that could get more light, you know, going back to our death uh, story from the Detroit boys or whatever. Like, so like, we started thinking about it and we're like, yeah, you know, and it makes sense because it's like the majority of our music is on fat. We have some Asian man stuff and we have Epitaph bookending it. But then, yeah, if we're going to put out like a greatest hits thing, why wouldn't it be on fat? We're still buds with Epitaph and like, if we make a new recording, we would probably tell Epitaph and be like, do you guys want to put this out? And if they said no, <laughs> then we would try to figure something else out. I'm sure Fat would be there, whatever. But I mean, that's neither here nor there because we're not, we're not at that point yet. But, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, you, you're one of the very few bands who have been on two of the major punk labels. I mean, what's the difference between the two? The difference? Well, I mean, Epitaph became a, like a juggernaut in the 90s with Rancid and Offspring and you know, even like no effects through the through the 90s, uh, up until late 90s or early 2000s. Um, 
So they they have a they just have a different connection level when you deal with uh, advertisement, and even you know Brett has diversified his roster to where he's not a punk label. So he's got punk, but he also has like the weird, yeah, but, but even yeah, you know, like the weird like um, uh, emo stuff where the the guys all have the weird spiky haircuts and stuff. Uh, there's a bring me the horizon and stuff like that. Yeah, falling in reverse or whatever, and like I don't like that stuff at all, but I understand that that's bringing in the money. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it's like, that's the difference. Fat Wreck is not going to sign shitty bands just to make money. And Brett will, but also what Brett will do is he'll take that money he makes from shitty bands and he'll put out my shitty bands record. <laughs> <laughs> so, and you know, it's like Hot Water uh, got to, what was on uh, Epitaph, which is cool. So we kind of like got to meet up with them for a second. But even though they're on, I think they're on a different label now, but... Um, you know, propaganda was on there. So what we're saying is thank you, Bring Me Horizon, for allowing me to put out my album, even though your band sucks. I mean, that's just my opinion. I mean, they're probably great to other people, of course. I don't know, you, your opinion's right. Our beers are finishing, uh, and I've taken up so much of your time. So let's, let's finish with always a subject matter, if anyone's ever signed to Fat, is what's your favorite Fat Mike story? Um, fuck. I don't... <laughs> I don't know if I really have any specific Fat Mike stories that are my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's he. One of the weirder nights was in Chicago after the Riot Fest in 2009 when he dressed as Koki the Clown and made the video. Yeah. So the night of that, we all went back to this dungeon of a friend of ours, and it was it was like me and Mike and Melvin and Derek from the trio and a couple other people, and we just had this sort of like very it was like low key but also a dungeon you know so it was like if you wanted to go get whipped or go get like this kind of thing happen or whatever um yeah like you know Derek and I uh, shaved our faces and put on dresses and kind of hung out for a while with these dominatrix you know and and Mike was going doing whatever he was doing I mean it was just that to me was like I had never been inside of Mike's like other life like that his like world. his yeah. world yeah like I know that I know his touring world and like the label and just sort of partying like that. But that was like that was like oh okay so this is his comfort zone. <laughs> this is his Sunday. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, man, I've taken up so much of your time, Neil. Thanks, yeah. pal. And do more interviews. Like you, you've got a story. It's it's good to hear. I appreciate that. Thanks, Liam. It's uh, this is a very comfortable setting. However, this uh, manifested. So I appreciate it. And you never know, maybe I'll do another one in a couple of years. My eyes open to the emptiness. My face is not there, I'm looking like. Thank you to Neil for taking the time to talk to me and putting up with the tech issues and a drunken man. Hopefully, Neil will be back on the show in the future and I will be uh, more competent, I suppose is the right word. Uh, Speaking of the future, I'm working on an amazing Christmas special for you guys and I hope, I hope it comes off because if it does... Oh, you're going to love it, and I'm going to love doing it. Right, that's it for episode 26. Just time to say thank you to Stephen Burke for audio assistance and that fucking amazing video. Go check it out on the socials. Hit him up on Twitter at Stephen Burke 123 While you're at it, check us out on the socials at Punks and Pubs. Go rate and review and all that really helpful stuff. Playing at the show this week is Just Say Nay. They are an incredible 11-piece band 
fuck. They must be a sight to see, so definitely check them out if they're playing in your area. This track is called Pass Me A Cloud. Right, time to go. If you're going to a punk show and you see someone fall down, you pick them right back up. Until next time, bye bye. She says just to love We are the storm and enough is enough